All right, so now let's dive into this question of how does the gut microbiome actually influence the brain? One of the powerful ways that what happens in the gut gets to the brain, which we've discussed a little bit, is the immune system. But how does that relate to the gut microbiome? Well, as I've mentioned, the majority of your immune system is situated in the gut. And obviously, the majority of your microbiome is situated in the gut. Well, these two incredible systems of cells communicate with each other constantly, bilaterally, meaning they go back and forth. So your gut microbiome speaks to your gut immune system, your gut immune system speaks to your gut microbiome. Your immune cells in your gut are receiving data from your gut microbiome and changing their function based on that information. And here's something that I didn't know until relatively recently. Your immune systems in your gut are actually stronger when there is a healthy microbiome. You would think, oh, well, they have to defend against all these microbes. That's not the case. They're actually building resistance, building resilience, because they're getting data from the microbiome. So that's really important to consider. The other thing is, the gut microbiome is being influenced by your immune system. Your gut immune cells are producing chemicals that kill off unhealthy microbes and that allow for the growth of the healthy microbes. Okay, well, how does all of this get to the brain? We'll talk about this in a moment. But the basic idea here is your gut immune cells are changing as a result of your gut microbiome. Your gut immune cells influence your overall immune system, impact your brain. But also the gut microbiome influences systemic immunity by way of products it produces that can lead to either a pro or anti-inflammatory response in the body and likely then impact the brain. Another way in which the gut microbiome can impact the brain is that we know that the health of the gut microbiome impacts the health of the gut lining. Now you may have heard of something called leaky gut. And what does that mean? It means that in a perfect world, your gut is able to allow penetration of what it needs to have, so key nutrients, key signals, but it keeps out a whole bunch of junk that you don't want in your bloodstream. It's thought to be the case that in some people, the gut lining can become a little bit more holy, a little bit more leaky, allowing for certain aspects of the gut microbiome to get through that gut lining and get into the bloodstream. So if your gut microbiome is producing healthy molecules, that can be a good thing. If it's producing unhealthy molecules, that can be a bad thing. What we now understand is that that gut lining, the health of your gut cells, is actually contingent on the health of the gut microbiome because your gut cells use products made by your gut microbiome as food. So let's put that into context. You're eating food that feeds your gut microbiome, for example, fiber. Your gut microbiome is eating that fiber and producing food for your gut cells called short chain fatty acids. And in return, your gut cells are protecting your body and your brain from things within your gut that could be problematic. It's a very complex system, but it's worth knowing about. The bacteria in your gut produce a wide range of different molecules. And so you may have heard that they can make things like vitamins. And that's actually true. The bacteria in your gut can produce various vitamins, some of which may be important to your brain health. But I wanna come back to what I mentioned before, which is that the bacteria in your gut produce molecules that feed your gut cells. These again are called short chain fatty acids. Something that we now understand is that some of those short chain fatty acids can be absorbed into the bloodstream and may reach and influence your brain health. These have names like butyrate, and that's really important because now we understand that not only are these molecules potential food sources, but they can also serve to influence epigenetics, which is a complex topic, but it basically means that these molecules that are produced by your gut microbiome may actually impact the way that your DNA is used throughout your body and may have effects on how your brain functions. So really important to understand here that the bacteria in your gut microbiome can impact your brain in a variety of ways. And one of those ways is that they produce these products called short chain fatty acids that may penetrate into and influence your brain state. I mentioned before, but for completeness, we need to mention again that the gut microbiome can impact the vagus nerve. So we've talked about the vagus nerve, we talked about the gut microbiome. How do those two things come together? Well, your vagus nerve has all sorts of nerve endings that are distributed throughout your GI tract. And it's in essence sensing for data. So it's waiting to hear, is your gut stretched out? In which case it should tell your brain, maybe you shouldn't be eating so much anymore. It's also sensing for data from your gut microbiome. It has receptors as well for immune cells, as far as what the immune cells put out in your gut. 
And so this is a very, very quick way by which what happens in your gut can directly influence your brain function because the vagus nerve can travel directly and incredibly quickly to the brain. So it's much quicker than allowing things to get from the gut into your bloodstream to influence your brain health. Let's dive into the idea of the immune effects from the gut on the brain. So as I mentioned, the majority of your immune system is located in your gut. And the gut microbiome and your gut immune system are always talking to each other. Something I alluded to before, but I want to get into in a little bit more detail, is the idea that the signals from your microbiome have systemic immune effects. And by systemic, I mean something that affects the entire body. So there are certain types of bacteria that produce various molecules that, for example, have names like LPS or lipopolysaccharide. Now, LPS is known to be an instigator of inflammation. And in fact, when researchers do trials to see how to increase inflammation, they'll often use this part of a bacteria called LPS to increase levels of inflammation. We know that when people have an overgrowth of certain types of bacteria and when they have evidence of a leaky gut, that it might be more likely that this LPS gets into the bloodstream. But here's where it gets really interesting. So when researchers test the effects of inflammation on our brain function, they have found that when you inject somebody with LPS, which is again, a piece of a bacteria that can be found in the gut, they tend to experience more symptoms of depression. So what we're talking about here is that there are certain bacteria within your gut that can produce these molecules like LPS that are linked to conditions like depression. It's also thought that this molecule, which goes also by the name of endotoxin, may have a driving role in a variety of other negative brain states. So the bacteria in your gut are activating this immune pathway by way of LPS, and it's another reason why having the right balance of the microbes in your gut is an important consideration when it comes to brain health. So let's talk about ways in which your metabolic health and your hormonal health are influencing your brain by way of the gut. So metabolism is the way that you convert the fuel from your food into fuel within your body. Hormones or the endocrine system is a wide ranging system of molecules that float throughout your bloodstream and have effects throughout the body. But these are two systems that are significantly implicated in this gut brain connection. So let's talk about how this works. One of the key drivers of this connection are what are called the short chain fatty acids that we've alluded to already. When you feed your gut microbiome fiber, so fiber are carbohydrates that we can't digest, but that the gut microbes can digest. These gut microbes, if they're the healthy ones, tend to produce molecules like short chain fatty acids. And these short chain fatty acids are actually a form of saturated fatty acid. A little nuance there because, oh wait, saturated fatty acids are always bad. Well, not exactly. Short chain fatty acids have names like acetate, propionate, and butyrate, and they in fact, make up about 10% of our calories that we use each day. But we now know that they are far more significant than simply calories in our body. As I mentioned before, these are molecules that appear to have wide ranging effects on everything from our immune function to our epigenetic regulation. And these are molecules that are primarily made by microbes. You might be able to get them in certain foods and drinks in much smaller quantities, but we really rely on our microbes to produce these molecules. Now, beyond just these metabolic molecules, these short chain fatty acids, it's worth noting that the gut produces molecules like ghrelin and GLP-1. It produces a whole bunch of other molecules, but both of these are kind of relevant for us right now. What are these molecules? Well, ghrelin is a molecule that is primarily produced in the stomach. And when people are given ghrelin or when ghrelin levels go up, people feel hungry. So ghrelin levels produced by the gut when we're hungry uh, basically tells us that there is a direct signal between this molecule and how our brains function. GLP-1, you might have been hearing about recently as it's been in the news. So GLP-1 is another molecule produced by the gut that is involved with hormonal and metabolic effects throughout the body. GLP-1 is involved with insulin regulation and with appetite. And what we've seen in the last little bit is people using pharmaceuticals that upregulate GLP-1 as a way of promoting weight loss. So while that's interesting, I think the more important thing for us to consider right now is that GLP-1 is just one of a tremendous number of molecules produced by the gut that impacts our brain function. And that both of these molecules, ghrelin, GLP-1, and others, 
are influenced by the food that we eat. So when we choose certain foods, it is impacting our gut. In doing so, it is impacting our brain by way of these types of molecules. I'd also like to talk for a moment about effects on the gut lining. So how does what happens in the gut and the impact on the gut lining influence the brain? As I mentioned, we have this gut barrier. And so the gut barrier is in essence what separates the outside of the gut where our food is and our microbes are with the inside of the gut. We're understanding that leakiness or increased permeability of this gut barrier is linked to a wide variety of health issues. And one thing that we're now understanding is that leakiness of this gut barrier may actually increase leakiness of the blood brain barrier, which is important. We have, as I mentioned before, this blood brain barrier that in essence goes all the way around our brain and helps to protect our brain from things in our bloodstream that we wouldn't want to get inside of our brain. So things like infections, things like inflammation, other molecules that are floating around in our bloodstream that we really want to try to keep out from within our brain. But some research suggests that there are instances in which this blood brain barrier can become damaged. And some of those have been associated with what happens in the gut. So there's now a link between a increased leakiness of the gut barrier and an increased leakiness in the blood brain barrier. All right, so I've alluded to this multiple times, but let's talk about this vagus nerve, which I'm sure you've heard about in some conversation by now. As it relates to the gut brain connection or the gut brain axis, the vagus nerve generally occupies a central stage. And so to start with, appreciate that this is the longest of the cranial nerves, which means runs from the brain to somewhere else within the body. It goes all the way from your brainstem to your large intestine, and it goes back again. Something that I only learned recently is despite the fact that you have all of these nerve fibers within the vagus nerve, the majority of those nerve fibers actually run from your gut to your brain which is fascinating. Why would so many nerve fibers be carrying data to the brain as opposed to the other way around? Well, the reason for this is because there's so much information to glean from the outside world. You know, if you think about it, your gut is one of your principal barriers with the outside world. This is where your body is being exposed to so much data, so many data points, all those microbes, all those pieces of food in your gut. It's telling your brain what's happening outside, just like your eyes and ears are telling you what's happening outside. And so the vagus nerve seems to be one of the central conduits by which the data from your gut can influence your brain function in real time. And all of these fibers that run from your gut to your brain are called afferent fibers. And again, a really key takeaway here is the majority of the nerve fibers in your vagus nerve run from your gut up to your brain. How do these nerve fibers change what happens in your brain? Well, it seems that the speed at which these nerve fibers fire actually influences the way that your brain processes. So based on the receptors on this vagus nerve, your brain is getting differential input as far as what is happening in the gut. And again, we're talking real time. We're not talking minutes. We're talking less than a second. Let's talk for a moment about some of these sensors on the vagus nerve. So the vagus nerve, as I mentioned, runs both directions, but on the tips of these nerve fibers, you have all of these different receptors and sensors that are trying to detect what is happening in your gut. These sensors pick up data from short chain fatty acids, which as I mentioned, are some of these metabolic byproducts that are produced by the gut microbiome. They also pick up data from neurotransmitters that microbes make. In addition, they pick up data from inflammatory molecules produced by the gut's immune system and they're sensitive for those same metabolic hormones that I've described, like ghrelin. So what I'd like for you to understand is this vagus nerve is kind of a super highway that allows for data from all of these different sources, the gut microbiome, the gut immune system, uh, gut hormones, to reach the brain very quickly. So while we've thought for a while that food is something that has to be digested before it's going to have any effects on our physiology, We've now learned that is anything but the case and that your brain is constantly listening to the quality of what you put in your food.